Um, you obviously talked about being from the area, getting to play for your team. How do you feel Alabama prepared for you guys for the NFL? I feel like we're prepared from a mental aspect. Like phys physically, I feel you know ready and able to do my job. But just from a mental aspect, learning how to handle challenges that are going to come out way, uncomfortable situations, being comfortable, getting uncomfortable. Um, just handling the process every day. And I know it's going to be fun. I know it's going to be tough. But just trusting in the process that there's an end goal in sight and there's light at the end of the tunnel is going to help me get through it. And I feel like Alabama helped prepare me for that. All right, knowing growing up a Redskins fan, I assume, um, with the issues they had defensively, how excited are you with getting an opportunity to make an impact? It's, it's, it's a blessing. It's, it's truly a blessing to be able to say I'm a part of the team that I watched growing up. So I, I'm excited and I'm ready to just get to work to help contribute to this team immediately. Did you get a chance to see some of the players' reaction on Twitter last night about you guys? Yes, I was tweeting the bag. Couldn't even seem real. So it was really cool, man. Just, just, just they all welcomed me in, and now it's up to me to put the Redskins right for drafting me where they did. I was asking Jonathan. Obviously, he grew up a fan of the Redskins growing up. For you, just was it like knowing that a childhood dream came true? It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I think for you, for what you do on the field, very versatile player. Um, I don't know how much of the Redskins you watched last year, but sorely needing versatile, versatility on the field. You know, so Craven's a versatile guy. Um, with the way the NFL game is changing, why do you think your skill set is, is so important or so attractive to teams? I think, lastly, going to Alabama, obviously we know the, the wonderful prestige and the great, what it looks like on you guys' resume. How, how well did it prepare you guys for this level of play? What's going on, everybody? It's another wonderful Tuesday here in studio. Happy to be here. We got Miss Octavia White. Uh, Cardell Dudley. She got the game on. That's what that noise is. Gonna put sorry. You on <laughs> sorry, I tried to turn it down. I'm sorry. It was supposed to be quiet. Look, you've been here long enough. You're going to get put on blast. It's all right. Cardell, welcome back. I know, man. Hey, you've been I, gone. I get just going on me today. I wanted to do the little video for social media. I was like, he really hasn't been in the studio for two weeks. Yeah, yeah you've been gone. Yeah. Been MIA. Jim was calling me, man. <laughs> Stay in the gym. Gotta be a gym rat. Um, Coach McCray, thank you. Yep. Coming in. No problem, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Well, we're obviously going to talk to you today. <laughs> <laughs> no, Since let's I, wait till tomorrow. Nah, I gotta do it. I don't, I'm not making a job to DC tomorrow. I'm going to avoid that tomorrow as much as I would like to talk to Coach tomorrow. And I'm sure you're busy tomorrow as well. Uh, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> as a Division One coach, you got a lot of things to do. Um, for us on tonight's show, we're going to be talking to Coach McCray. We're going to be talking to Carl from Retrofit a little bit later as well. Um, and you guys just saw the Jonathan Allen interview and Ryan Anderson interviews. So if you want to see more, more from us, more of that, you can head over to my mom sports, head over to finest mag. Um, the new issue is still out. Please continue to go check it out, support it. Um, I heard it's doing quite well. So thank you all. I'm going to thank yes, you guys thank on behalf you. of Cardell, you know, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Seriously. A lot of diapers need to be bought. So. <laughs> <laughs> They're not cheap. Um, also, we're going to talk a little bit about the Mystics because the WMA season is starting. We're going to talk some Wizards, obviously, then the playoffs. Going to update you guys on the capital situation. They're also in the playoffs. So how about that, D.C.? You got two teams in the playoffs. You got another hopeful contender in the WNBA mm -hmm. with the addition of Elena, Christy, and some more, po some more folks. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And then, as always, Cardell's back, so that means rapid fire. And you can't cheat this And one. I can't cheat. <laughs> I can't cheat. That means rapid fire. So, Coach, that, I don't know if you know about rapid fire with our show. I don't. Okay. Tell me about it. Your seat's okay. going to get warm. That's cool. <laughs> that's cool. That, that's, that's, cool. That's, that's all I really can help you with as far as that goes. No problem. So, again, you guys are watching The Focus. We're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we're going to jump into this conversation with Coach McCray. Okay. Yep.
up, everybody? I'm Carl. I got a brand name, Retro Fate. Had it for about five and a half years. Uh, a lot of ups and downs. Um, started it based off of my little brother passing away, my 10th grade year of high school. Uh, it was just something I always planned to do after basketball. Played basketball all my life, but you know that kind of changed my, my mindset on everything. So the brand is pretty much based around him, just hard work, you know, using <laughs> Using what I have to open other doors for you know the people around me. I've got my wife in certain you know certain rooms with people that you know we don't have to work for other people and we really could do what we want to do. Uh, the brand is really just a I mean everybody says lifestyle but it's really just whatever you want it to be. Everything it, you know tells a story has a meaning. Um, I don't really make anything for gimmicks. I'm not using you know naked women or anything lewd. You know it's all positive because I want kids of all ages to be able to wear it as well as adults. Uh, it's been doing really well. Just trying to get better. Glad to be working with the Focus family. Uh, you'll be seeing more of me. We're back. And uh, as we said before, we have Delaware assistant men's basketball coach, Corey McCray. What's going on? Man? What's up, man? How you doing? Doing real good. Glad yeah. to have you. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it so I think much. This is a very important episode that we need so for a lot of players and coaches and parents. So Yeah. Uh, the first question I want to ask you, you know, is related to last season. Um, Guys at Delaware finished 13 and 20. Right. Um, obviously, that's not the you know ideal record, but right. it was your first year, so y'all trying to you know what I'm saying, build things up. So, yeah. um, how was the first season, and what do you feel you need to do to kind of you know change that around to where the next season or possibly in the future be 20 and 13? Yeah. Well, when we took over the program, we were 7 and 24, and then uh, we almost doubled the win total. You know, being 13 and 20. So, we're excited about the progress that we're making. Uh, obviously, we got to get better. And you know, college basketball, it's about players. I mean, any, any sport, it's about players. So getting the right players in there, and not just basketball players, but the right people, you know what I mean? Kids that want to do good academically and going to be grinders, going to be in the gym all the time. So just continuously building good recruiting classes, I think that's the key, and guys buying into you know, what we're trying to do as a staff. Um, one thing you mentioned just now, you said good people. Um, you know, I talked to a lot of basketball people. Some people seem to think, you know, if the talent is big enough, you know, you can overlook the character, so to speak, yeah. if it's not that good. Um, like, what's your tip on that? I, I totally think this it's the opposite. Um, if you got bad character kids, it's going to destroy your program. Uh, you may win four or five more games with a more talented kid in that season, but overall you need good people in your program because those kids are going to come to work every day. Those kids are going to do what they got to do academically. Those kids are going to you know, not get in trouble off the court. You know what I mean? So it's so much more important uh, to have good character kids and uh, not to say more important than talent because talent is still important, but that's that's huge, man. Okay. A bright spot from last season was, you know, point guard Ryan Daly. You yeah. know, talk about him. Uh, he kind of caught a lot of people off guard, you know what I'm saying? I saw the damage he did, you know, yeah. talk about what makes him special and what are you looking forward to seeing from him in this upcoming season? Well, he, uh, he actually had one Division One offer oh, wow. coming in. He had uh, all D2s and stuff. You know, people just didn't think he was good enough. He went to the high school that my coach uh, went to, and the coach was kind of like, oh, should we take him? Should we not? It's late. You know, we got the job late. And he took him, man, and uh, the kid ended, ended up averaging 17-9, and nine, getting rookie of the year in the CAA. He just believes every time he gets on the court that he's better than everybody. <laughs> he's tougher than everybody. He, he can't jump over a, a phone book. He can't go past me, you, right now. <laughs> but he's tougher than everybody. He makes shots. He's a good kid. He works hard. And uh, that's separated him. He just really believes. His confidence is through the roof. He really believes he's the best player on the court every time we play. Okay. Uh, being an assistant at the Division One level, how different or similar is it compared to coaching in high school and on the AAU level? Well, the, the thing about college is you're doing it full time. Um, high school, you do it full time as well, but it's September to March. Okay. You know, now, you know, it's all year long for us. This is what we do for a living. Um, recruiting. I mean, I'm not just going to Charles Curl Middle School or running shoot to go recruit now. Okay. I'm going to Atlanta. I'm going to Indiana. I'm going to Vegas. I'm going to Florida. So that's one of the biggest things is just the recruiting part. But, but I like it. I enjoy it. Um, I get to meet a lot of kids. And I just really want to affect people's families and be a positive influence and effective as you know the best I can. Okay, um, played at the math under some great teams, you know, for the legendary Hall of Fame coach Morgan Wooten. Right. Um, how much influence does he have over you now that you're coaching? You know, I probably talk to uh, Coach Wooten maybe once a month. Um, I probably should call him a little bit more than that, but I talk to him about once a month. But 
you know, his thing was God, family, school, basketball, mm -hmm. and in that order, and that's what we had to live by. So that's kind of some of the things we're trying to teach our guys now. So uh, stuff he taught us in 2001, 2002 is the same thing I'm trying to, you know, influence and teach my guys in 2016. Okay. Um, you were athletic trainer for a with ASM, sports management, yeah. 2009. Yeah. You trained a lot of NBA guys who were ready for the, you know, upcoming season. When, right. How was that? And, how, and, and that's special in a sense because, you know, obviously there's a lot of trainers now. Right. So, you know, you kind of came out the gate, so to speak, in that level. You know, how does that help you with players now at Delaware and helping them develop, you know what I'm saying, and even before on the AAU circuit? So it was good to be out in Vegas, man. Um, I trained a lot of those guys, but I think the big one of the biggest things was they listened to me. Right. Um, and they were pros, you know. So I, I think one of the things was I really challenged them to get better. You know, I didn't just take what they did, their strengths, and just try to expand on it. I tried to expose their weaknesses to them. So once you expose somebody's weaknesses to them, they were much more willing to learn. So he would, so a lot of those guys were good. Uh, Alonzo G, Robert Vaden, um, Patrick O'Brien, uh, some of those guys, they were, they were really good. So uh, I take that and I tell those guys now, like if you listen, if you focus, if you just do what you're supposed to do, I'm going to make you better because I'm going to stay in the gym with you and I'm going to push you. Okay. For aspiring high school players, what advice would you give them as they transition to college? Because a lot of them feel like they have it already figured out. Right. But, you know, you know, I play college just like you did. Right. It, it's, a, it's a shock. Right, it is. I, I think they just need to trust the process and uh, listening. I, I mean, I mean that's really simple, but that's hard for people to do, especially kids now. You know, they think they got all the answers. So I think if people listen, they humble themselves, they come in with an open, minded, uh, open mind, and allow themselves to be coached. That's that's one of the biggest things. Allowing yourself to be coached is key because it's guys that's coaching you who've been where you're trying to go and who know way more than you. You know what I mean? So they just need to come in there, be coachable, listen, work hard. What's a typical day for a player in you know, college? Oh, schedule man. And wise, oh, man. Um, like I said, they think they know, but they have no idea what the workload is. When I, I tell you just today, this morning. So we got up uh, at 530. We had 6 o'clock workouts. So that's, that's on the off season. During the regular season, I mean, it depends when we have a game. If we have a game, you know, you're up early, you're traveling, you're practicing, you're in a hotel, you walk through. So it just depends on the part of the season. Okay. How intense are workouts and practices when freshmen, you know, like I said, they're coming in with right. the shock. But how intense are the practices and the individual workouts? Because I'm trying to get these high school players to really understand what they're about to, you know, go through. And I, I really think they don't have an idea. So they understand what's coming. So maybe at the AAU or high school level, when the coaches tell you get in the gym, you be like, okay, I do. I need to get in the gym because right. so I can make that transition easy. So um, break down a typical workout or you know, in a practice. Well, the reason that the, the um, everything is different is because everything, the, the speed of the game, mm -hmm. on every level you go up gets higher. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's faster. Guys are bigger, faster, stronger. Mm -hmm. Um but, you know, we do ball handling in the workout. You know, you start out with ball handling, and uh, you transition from drill to drill a lot faster than you do in high school. I'm not saying it's not a lot of teaching, but coaches are the you know, try harder. He's not going to do that. What they're going to do is they're going to get you out there. They're going to tell you once. If you don't do it, they may tell you twice. And then after that, then, then you have issues because if you continue to do that in college, they just recruit over top of you. <laughs> they're not going to call your mommy and daddy and say, hey, you know, I need you to help me. It's a, hey, you know, we're going to go in a different direction. So I think guys just coming in and, and focusing, like I say, focusing and listening, they'll, they'll be fine. But the level of now, you know, in high school or girls club, you know, everybody plays, everybody's happy. But in college, this is our lobby. This is how we do our family. So it's not a lot of playing around with you. Telling you, playing once or twice, and we're moving up. To the corner, Jack. To the corner. You're looking at a player. What are you looking for 
that would make you be like, okay, I want to offer him? I think I think for me it's five things. Uh, the first thing is competitive. Okay. You know, are you out there grinding? Are you out there working hard? Are, uh, does it mean something to you when you lose? Uh, the second thing is your skill level. You know, can you pass? Can you shoot? You know, what kind of what kind of player are you? Um, the third thing is your IQ. Like, it's a lot of fast guys out there. But what separates people is, is how smart you are as a basketball player. Um, the fourth thing and the fifth thing is, is – it's, it's, it's petty, but communication. How do you communicate with your teammates? You know, if, if you drive into the hole and you make a good pass and they miss a shot, miss a layup, are you pouting? Um, do you make guys around you better? Do you give your teammates confidence? That's, that's big. And then the last thing is body language. Like, if you get a foul or something doesn't go your way, are you pouting? Are you flaring your arms up? How do you respond when you walk off the court? Are you sitting over there? Are you, are you going to the end of the bench? Are you going to the front of the bench? Are you dapping all your teammates up? Are you looking at your coach eye to eye? Those are the little things that I look at to, uh, you know, when I'm in recruiting. What's an immediate turnoff? Are you like, oh, no, I can't I'm not deal with him. An immediate turnoff is a kid, for me, not getting back on defense. If you shoot the ball <laughs> and you walk back on defense, I can't stand it. That's like a pet peeve. I just can't stand it. So, for me, and again, everybody's different. <laughs> but that's one of my things, man. I, I don't like guys that, that – that that give up on their teammates or don't help each other out. Yeah, that's a lot of players. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know, man. I, I like know, y'all. man. I just it's hard. <laughs> parents. Ooh. Parents, parents, parents. This is gonna man, be good. This is this is this, <laughs> this is this is uh this is a sensitive subject right here. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna dress it up as this parents who overstep their boundaries. Okay. <laughs> disrespect. Okay. What advice would you give them from the coaching aspect? <sighs> First thing, I, I would tell the parents to just trust the process. I would tell the parents also to, at some point, you got to let your kids go and grow up. You got to let your kids go through things. Like, you got to let your kids make mistakes, and you got to let your kids make a mess. That's the only way they're going to be able to grow, um, first and foremost. So, you know, you got to let your kids go. But second of all, man, if you have a player, if you have two players you're looking at, one player, great family, mom and dad stay out the way. You know, they may not agree or like every decision you make, but they stay out the way and let you deal with it as a coach. And then you got another parent or player who, you know, is giving you problems or attitude, and you got to make a decision on if you're going to cut one and keep the other one. I'm keeping the one with the, with the better parents. Even if they're not the better player, I just know that's one less thing I got to deal with. Because as a coach, you got to deal with a lot of stuff, man. You know, you got to deal with travel. You just got to deal with, you know, winning. So if I got a parent that I'm, you know, having issues with or I know it's going to be an issue, I don't want to have nothing to do with it. Like, I, I love the – I think uh, LaMelo Ball and, and Lonzo Ball are great players. I could not deal with that father. <laughs> I'm I, sure you are not alone. Yeah. I couldn't deal with that father. Yeah. This is another sensitive one. Okay. <laughs> What's your thoughts on the transfer epidemic? Oh, man. You know, it's crazy because – I'm at that mid-major level, so high majors are taking our players. Yeah. Um, and it's tough for us because, I mean, sometimes if if I'm at like a Delaware and Maryland still is my best player, that really hurts me yeah. because in two, three years, if I'm not winning, I'm going to get fired. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I, I look at it as almost like when you're at a low major and mid-major now, it's almost like the high majors, the high majors recruit off your roster. And it's like a tryout for a Kansas or a Duke or North Carolina. It's, it's a trial for them for them high major teams. So I, I don't know how to stop it, man. I, I don't th- I don't think you can stop it. It's just something that we got to deal with and work with. But I mean, it's it's tough. It's tough, and it hurts the mid majors yeah. a lot. And it's I mean, it's like the rich get richer. Yeah, you are. Right. My last question is, what will it take to not only make Delaware CAA contenders? But NCAA tournament bound consistently. Just getting the right kids in there, man. I, I think we got the right staff, but just getting the right kids in there, uh, kids that's going to buy into what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody isn't for Delaware, and, and as a staff, we're not for everybody. So just getting the right kids in there, working hard, um, getting everyday guys. I mean, that's that's really important. You know, and people say, what is an everyday guy? Like somebody's going to come and be consistent. They're going to grind. They're going to do those things, even when they don't feel like it. Like, it's tough, man. I know sometimes going to work, sometimes you're like, oh, man, I really don't feel like it. But you got to do it. So we need guys that's going to be everyday guys. If we get those guys in there um, and those guys will play together and, and believe in each other and give each other confidence and be positive, we'll have a chance. We'll be good. Okay. Wilson, I'll tell you. 
Yeah, uh, y'all covered a lot <laughs> already. Um, I guess my biggest question is, what was the toughest thing to adjust to moving to, to D1 ball? Um, you know, man, the, the, the time that uh, my son and I, my family, it, it's different. You know, when I'm at the Matha, you know, we travel, we play McNamara, or we play Carroll, or we play somebody like that. Now at Delaware, now we're playing JMU or William & Mary or Wilmington. So just the time away from your kids and your family, that's, um, that's tough. You know, that's, that's tough. And then, you know, my kids weren't used to it because I was around every single day and not being around as much. So I think the biggest adjustment is your family situation. Um, it's going to get better, but it was rough early. I tell you, you have anything? You actually stole my question. Ooh. <laughs> I feel like you stole it out of my head. I definitely wasn't in there, so I can't take I'm any pretty sure you did. That. It's okay. Start him. No, I'm good. He answered everything. Yeah. I, I just try to, like I said, get the information out there because a lot of a lot of kids and parents don't get it, and um, they don't realize how much they hurt themselves. Mm. You know, when it's unnecessary. So, you know, he answered everything. Uh, are we about to do? No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, real quick, I um, I was so fortunate to coach Markel Falls, mm. who's potentially going to be the number one pick in the upcoming draft, man. And to speak about him and his mom, real quick. Uh, he got cut from the varsity team as a sophomore. Um, he came in as a freshman. First of all, he came in as a freshman. He worked hard. Came in as a sophomore. Was he good enough to play? Probably so. Um, but he stuck to the process. His mom never overstepped her boundaries. They never talked about transferring, none of that stuff in high school. And because he went through that, went through the process, worked hard, went, had a little adversity, that's not been, uh, you know, not been a varsity as a freshman. It made him so much of a better person and better player. And his mom, Ebony Foster, you know, I commend her because she really stayed out the way. Yeah. And, sh and she didn't spoil him. You know, what happens to a lot of kids now is they, they have so much so early. Right. You know what I mean? Like they're anointed and given everything as freshmen and eighth graders. Like, you know, they, they got these rankings like you're the best fifth grade in the country. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> you're not going from, you know, Charles Curl Middle School to Kentucky. You know what I mean? So they the way they did it was, was, was great. And everything he's getting right now, he deserves, man, because uh, he stayed in the gym. You know, he, he it was times he probably was like, why am I on JV? He never complained one day. Never. He never said, well, why am I here? You know, Coach, I don't feel like being here, or I'm not going to give you all I got today. He never did that, man. And uh, his mom would show up to JV games and clap. You know, she didn't walk around with an attitude and pissed off at the world because her son wasn't on varsity as a freshman or sophomore. She really stayed the course. And, man, I mean, they're, they are a, a great example of, of what parents and, and kids should do. And um, to piggyback off that, that's why a lot of people around here root for him. Yes. Saying, obviously, outside of basketball, the talent speaks for itself. But yes. Because he got it the hard way. I call it the old school way. No question. Like, um, I think me and you the same age. So it wasn't, like I always say, we couldn't run to our parents. But I mean, coach said we got to play JV. They're going to be like, so? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, like, Lucky you playing before, anything. Go figure Absolutely. it out. You know, go figure it out and make and change the coach's mind. And, you know, I remember that summer after the JV season, you know, DMV Lee Marcus told him, he told yeah. me, like, he just walked up to me like, uh, this kid Markel Foles. And I'm like, who? He's like that. You need to walk, you need to check him out. I was like, all right. So I saw y'all was playing up at um, Hoop Hole yeah. against Briscoe and Silver yeah. for South yeah. Carolina. Yeah. And he destroyed it. I was like, whoa. Like, you know, and that that really woke me up. Like, whoa. And like it, it looked like I mean he was the best player on the floor. And you know, you see Cal and Roy Williams and all them sitting there and he just and at the time Briscoe was what, top five in the country or something. So Brazil was top five as a yeah. team and he destroyed them. So that won me over and then just, you know, learning more, talking to Ange and everything about how yeah. he, he walks around like it works like he's the twelfth man. He That's doesn't great. he doesn't like the attention. Like when when this started like when he started like really blowing up, mm -hmm. he he didn't really like it because he wasn't used to that. Mm -hmm. You know? Um he's getting better at it now. It wasn't bad at it, but he was just like he's such a humble kid, mm -hmm. man. Like I've never met a kid who was more humble than than him. Um so, like you say, man, everything he gets, man, I, I'm so happy for him. I, he deserves it. His family deserves it. And, you know, he's going he's gonna to change the change the way his family's going to live for the rest of their lives. Man, he should change the perspective of a lot of kids coming up under him. Like, look, he got it the hard way. It came late for him, and look where he's at. He and, should be the number one pick, honestly. So, if 
you know, you want the – you don't have to feel entitled. You don't have to give coaches a hard time. No. Just follow that same path. Just put the work in. He wasn't that good early on. I mean, he was good, but he wasn't like, okay, he is a stud with freshmen. He's going to play varsity as a freshman. Mm -hmm. He was good, but he worked. He stayed in the gym. Like, we had to be like, Markel, you got to get out the gym. He'll take more shots and more shots and more shots. Um, his mother would bring him to all the workouts. You know, he would do extra school work. He was just doing all the little extra stuff that it took to be successful, man. So everything he gets, he deserves. Yes, sir. All right, Coach, we want to thank you for your portion of the show. I appreciate um, it. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, to your past success. We wish you future success as well. I appreciate Welcome it. Welcome back anytime as always. And we're going to take a quick break, talk a little local coverage, and then we're going to get into that whole rapid fire thing, <laughs> which I can't wait to see what Cardell has for it this week. Um, you're watching The Focus, and we'll be right back. So the, little, the new line is inspired by my son. I look at him every day and I'm wondering why people, you know, aren't there for their kids. A lot of things are like, you know, like we have a shirt called Mind Jaws. Uh, it looks like the universe on the shirt and it just has like in small writing, Mind Jaws. Um, we have another t-shirt called The Made By. I got that on right now, got a hood on it. Um, I feel like everything is man-made in this world. Our parents sometimes aren't able to teach us, you know, the proper tools as far as like, uh, encouraging us to say we can do whatever we want which is a lie and the truth at the same time because you got to do what you're good at you know to the fullest um so i made a lot of shirts in this line to kind of gear the youth as well as just people you know of all ages to keep following their dreams and figuring out what their dreams are and never really stop living uh you can find everything um in two weeks at retrofate.com that's r e T R O F the number eight T E dot com. Uh, everything is, you know, great prices because I make everything myself by hand. Um, I just want to keep everything affordable for the people that, you know, may not have the hundred dollars to buy a T-shirt. So, you know, you can still be flying, you know, not have to break the bank. So, definitely check that out when it's coming. Welcome back. We are on the focus. Thank you for watching thus far in the show. Uh, you know, arguably one of the best parts coming up next. At least one of the most, um, what's the best way to describe the end of the show with Rapid Fire? Um, I tell you, you got one for me. Man, just getting some truth. You, you never know what's going to come up. <laughs> like, that's the part of the show. Like, last week it was so great because I got to control it a little bit. You should have saw and, and look, I felt all powerful and stuff. Like, that's, that's what you feel like. He sure did. <laughs> It was like, next? <laughs> <laughs> you answer. You know what I'm saying? But we're happy to have you back. And unfortunately, I'm back on my side of And I'm happy about rapid it. Rapid fire. You're happy about it. Okay. That's where Appreciate you're Appreciate it. It's cool, man. I've been so nice today and everything. But Coach, again, thank you for being here. Absolutely. It's great. Um, and folks, as always, local coverage, I mean, you know, head over to Finest Mag. The, the, the issue is still brand spanking new. Get over there. Get your hands on it. Um, shout out to everyone that's in the issue. I thoroughly enjoy going through it. Um, to see some of the best players in the area, why they got the accolades that they did. Um, Cardell, you did a great job, sir. Appreciate it. Um, Appreciate and then head over to my mom's sports after you head over to Finest Mag. Um, we keep you trying to keep you guys upset, updated on DC United, um, the Redskins, uh, the Valor, which are off to a slow start. You know, just hashtag DC Sports for that one and one and two. They don't really know how to complete a football game yet. We get off to strong starts, and the second half, everything goes boom. And not the good kind of boom. You do, and, and you will. And we look forward to the package that you come back with from said game.
because I'm not going to do anything. I shouldn't you are. Have even said anything. <laughs> you shouldn't have said anything at all. <laughs> but the floor is yours, sir. Okay, well, let's get right to it. Here here's a, here's an easy one. Okay. What grade would you give your respective NFL teams following the draft? Oh man, you're hey. we gonna start hey. with together. Oh, hey. We on, start with the guests. <laughs> I'm overly excited. Okay, <laughs> I text you this. I'm overly excited. But coach, the floor is yours. I apologize. So, rest is my team. All I know is we got Jared Allen and we got another linebacker or somebody from Oklahoma. I mean, from uh, Alabama. I would give us. We got two Alabama guys. I give us a B plus. Okay. And a cornerback from somewhere, but I guess it's a B plus. Okay. Um, I'm gonna say a B as well, mm -hmm. just because I can never be a hundred percent in. You know, sometimes they <laughs> they do crazy things. Um, but I will give it a, give us a B. I definitely feel like they address um, the needs on defense, um, especially at cornerback, because they kill me every Sunday. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I'm gonna say a B plus as well. All right, for your Redskins, I'm giving your Redskins like an A plus plus. Um, Jonathan Allen. Top five talent in the draft. I know Ben is falling to 17. Ryan Anderson's a top 10 talent in the draft. You got him in the second round. So maybe we missed the last two years and Alabama defense was outstanding. Yeah. Shout out to everybody else not watching meaningful games <laughs> because of draft things, apparently. Um, Fabian Moreau, the corner you mentioned, a height, weight, size guy, freaking nature, six foot, 200 pounds, 4'3", 140. Can't never ha ever have the, uh, enough of those guys. Um, you had, a, you had a, a guy from a small school, late wide receiver. I believe it's Robert Davis. Another height, weight, size guy. Things that can't hurt. You get Jeremy Sprinkle, a tight end from Arkansas. That's a great look. You didn't really need an extra tight end. and Instead, you get one that's big, arguably taller than, you know, he's a bigger target than the other two guys. Um, so I think it was a great job for the Redskins. I'm a Niner fan. The first thing I got to be happy about, shout out to John Lynch for finessing the you-know-what off the Bears. Um, I'm happy, man. Reuben Foster, Solomon Thomas. You know, arguably two five top two top five talents in the draft, and you get them, you get one at thirty one, because again, bad teams stay bad. I don't know how Ruben <laughs> Foster fell to thirty one, but thank you, Lord, I'm happy for it, um, and I'm actually excited for like ten <coughs> seconds of this NFL season. I know it'll be gone soon, but <laughs> real quick, if I was ever on a show. And I need a lifeline. I'm calling you. I'm calling, you. <laughs> I'm calling a friend. I'm calling you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Cardell? Oh, for my Broncos? Yeah, I you know. We talked about you. You got a little pickup today. But, you know. I mean, if you stay healthy, then you know, it's an A+. Plus, you know, but, you just got, but, you know, our focus is the line. So, I'm mm -hmm. glad that they started dressing that. So, I got to give it a you know, B because I got to see what they do. But... You know, everything's based off our old line. If our old line straight, let's rumble. You know, mm -hmm. we definitely need that with Marshawn Lynch to the Boy. Raiders. Hey, what were your initial thoughts when that became official? Because I meant to text you. I, don't I think was like, oh, well, we need an offensive line. <laughs> don't play the game. You know, like, we can't beat anybody. Trevor Simeon on his back all game. You know, so, and then um, Houston, you, you already know the problem. You know, Tyree Hill, that he, oof. That, that man, he, he's a one-man wrecking crew. And, um. Dude, they they played. I know the AFC West played the NFC East this year, so I don't know if the Chiefs come here or they go out there. But Red Saints fans will see what we have to deal with every year. And he's a problem. I'm like, uh, you know, keep the ball away from him as much as possible because he could take it to the house. He's a problem. But um, you know, I, I like what we did. We just got to you know see how the young boys playing out. You know, come training camp. So Derek Wolf will get them ready. We'll see real quick. <laughs> and Von Miller, yeah, we gonna we gonna see. So could I also throw like a shout out to the Cleveland Browns for having the most non Browns draft ever <laughs> for like actually doing good things they did good team type things the entire draft so shout out to them because I, I know they get they get you know people trash them all the time you know we we make fun of them on a regular basis they had a good draft man just want to give kudos regime. with it gotta give them time man got the one shout out out there too? sure a uh, shout out to um it's a you know i went to a and t and not not a lot of uh, yes sir not a lot of MEAC players get drafted, so shout out to Tariq Cohen. Got drafted in the fourth round to the Bears. It's real big for our school, you know. Everybody supported him in three years. Uh, I believe he's MEAC uh, player of the year three years in a row. Yes, wow. So yes, Lord. He yes. he he will be a problem, you know. He's small like Darren Sproles, and he's fast like him too. So definitely shout out to him. And the last HBCU back to win in the fourth round to the Bears, Walter Payton. Wow. Sweet. Oh, that little caveat out there. My bad, Cardiff. Mm -hmm. You mean a hijack rack of fire. Right, we done. Go. <laughs> That's good history, though. Nike on Armour and Adidas all decided not to deal with Lonzo Ball. Hallelujah. Would you fire him if fire LeBar? You know, that, you know, that's his father. Would you fire him? 
Um, me personally, um, if I was Lonzo, I would. Um, okay. Like, if it was me and my dad, I wouldn't because I know my dad wouldn't act like that. <laughs> but, I mean, to me, it's hurting him in the in the long run. Yeah. And that's what, you know, him being an adult now, you know, going into the oh, NBA right. draft, yeah. like, you have to start to make decisions for yourself. Yes, your father should be there to give you guidance and everything, but he's not the end-all, be-all for your career. So if he definitely wants to be involved in some of these other programs, like with Adidas and Under Armour and, and, and Nike and possibly Jordan Brand and, and everything going forward, you know, he's either going to have to put a leash on his dad and, and have him step back some, or he's going to have to fire him. You know, yeah. just to be real, I would do it to be completely honest because obviously you see it's not going over so well in the beginning and how you start is how you finish oh yeah <clears throat> um i mean there's still a couple other sneaker companies out there <laughs> we're in china hey look man hey some people make a lot of money from china with you shoes right. to throw that out there you right <laughs> but um no i'm not surprised by it like it's been building that way the entire time you i think i think it's great i understand where he's coming from with the shock value to get attention but you gotta turn that down. You still have. You still. You're still trying to be a businessman, so you gotta turn that down at times too. And I just don't think Dad knows how to balance it that well. Uh, you got five. You got go. <laughs> Off the break. Now, uh, first thing I would do, I would ask him to apologize to everybody. I would ask him to apologize for all the shoe companies because he's losing millions of dollars from his father right now. So I would apologize and try to get them back on my team. And then I would just I, I would ask him to slow down, or he had to leave. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, yeah, that right there. I mean, I, I guess like I said, how I was taught, you know, old school. You don't really make demands until you're in demand, and the only way you can get in demand is to put in work. Like you're just another player right now, and uh, you going to a grown man's league. All those players used to be you, you yeah. know, at some point. So you have to prove yourself. I know Levar brought up the Jordan effect, but I'm like, Brand Jordan didn't come until after he won three championships and two right. gold medals. And he was clearly the best player in the world. So it was like, you know, and he's still to this day the only one, not shoe lines, but the only one that has a brand. There's a reason for that. So you coming in off the break just because of one season at UCLA and demanding that, that's just, I mean, you bugging. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, true. you know, he got what he deserved for, you know, right now. We'll see how it unfolds. Uh, the Clippers lost to the Jazz in game seven. Who's the most to blame for them underachieving over the years? Doc Rivers, CP3. Blake or all of them share the same amount of blame. Start with you, Wilson. They should all. I think all the players should share the same amount of blame. Okay. Um, Doc, I think you should take the biggest amount of blame because you're also your own GM. Mm -hmm. So you've had the same holes in your team for what five seasons, and obviously the injuries play a big role, but those holes play a big role as well. So the biggest share of blame for me goes to Doc, and the players can share them evenly because I mean. Outside of DeAndre Jordan, they kind of take turns with the injury bug really hitting them. But, again, if Doc wasn't his own GM, I wouldn't feel that strongly. But you can't blame another – you put the team together. And I feel like you – the same problem they had five years ago, you still have right now. Yeah, I agree. I, I definitely feel like they all should share the blame. Um, but that's a great point about, you know, Doc being the GM. He's the people – he's the person that's bringing these people in and, and putting them together for a team. So, um, I definitely feel like he should take a little bit more of the blame. But, um, of course, the injuries hurt them a lot because I feel like maybe if they were more, you know, not hurt as much, you know, not saying it would change anything because there has been seasons when nobody's been hurt and they just still haven't got over that hill. Um, but, yeah, I definitely feel like it's all it's, – it's, it's time to blow it up and start over. Yeah, I think they need to take some C4 and <laughs> stick a dynamite and just put it in between the own two. Now, I, I, I'm not a Blake Griffin fan. I, I just I don't feel Blake Griffin. I, don't, I think I don't want to call him a coward, but I just think he's always injured or something. Some of his injuries are like phantom. I didn't see when he got hurt last time. I didn't either. All I know they said was his toe. I'm yeah, I, I didn't see it. So I, I just don't think he's that good, but it's, it's time to blow that entire team up. I, I, so I would blame Blake Griffin, because I don't like him <laughs> as a player. Um, I, mean, I feel like how y'all feel. It's just that time, man. Um, y'all tried. Chris Paul is getting up there in age. Uh, you know, as great as he is, I, I feel like for what a lot of people tell him as is, or, you know, they put him arguably the best point guard for years. I feel like in that sense he's a little overrated because um, when he matches up against the other elite guards, they give him the business, and, you know, he does his little work, but they really – it's clear that they're, you know, over him as, as far as their level right then and there. And that 
that's what ended up hurting the Clippers. And like you said with Blake, I think he, I feel you, he's soft. Yeah. Um, he don't play mean enough for me, man, especially with all the ability. You know, he, he came out of college jumping over the moon. He's 6'9". He, he had Barkley symptoms, yeah. but he's nowhere near, you know, Charles. But, like, he can't – his games where he had three rebounds. And I'm like, come on, man, you jumping over the moon, literally, and you can't give me more rebounds. That stuff matters. So, yeah, I agree with you. It's uh, – it's just time y'all have to do something, man, because this is not going to work, especially with the you know, Warriors being stacked up like they are. Utah's coming. Lord knows Houston right there. When, you know, they showed everybody, so you know, there's problems out west. Mr. Dwight Howard, he said he was unhappy with his role, not playing much late in games following you know, the first round loss, series loss to the Wizards. Is this typical Dwight, or does he have a point? I think it's, it's typical Dwight. Like, just <coughs> it is what it is. Like, Dwight Howard is defense rebound. He he's just not that good offensively. He he can't really score. So, like, what more do you want? I mean, he was in what? He was in Orlando. He was in Houston. He was he now is in Atlanta. Like, it's not everybody. It's him. Yeah. He's just not that good offensively. So, um, I think he needs to accept the defense rebound and just understand that. Be that guy and go like that because he's just not a good offensive player. Um, I think it's a little bit of both, but it's definitely, you know, it's Dwight being Dwight, you know, he's going to complain, unfortunately. You would think that this wouldn't be where we are since, you know, he was so excited to go back to Atlanta, I'm, I'm back home, and all that hoopla. Um, the only reason I say it's a little bit of both is, yeah, he probably didn't like his role, but it was a role that they needed to at least try to win the series. You know, like, it's not like his coach was just like, I don't want you to play. You know, he didn't fit for the scheme, you know. They're playing small ball. You're huge. Like, <laughs> what do you, what do you, what are you doing out there? You know, and not really contributing. So it's more so like you're taking up space from somebody else that can be out there. You know, trying to help. Um, so it's typical Dwight. You know, he pro I, I can see why he wouldn't like his role because he wants to be more, you know, involved and score more and things like that. But you know, he has to put in the work to actually do that. So I think for the first time in my life, I'm kind of with Dwight on this one. Um, I think. And also, I think it kind of coincides with the first time in my life that I think he really put in work on some of the issues he had with his game. He wasn't as horrible a free throw shooter this year. That's true. Um, he showed a little bit of improvement in the face-up game. And obviously, I, I'm kind of with you guys on a roll because, I mean, your play dictates the role to a degree. If you were, you know, superhuman in your role, maybe Coach Bud might have been like, all right, maybe we should change some things a little bit. But at the same time in that series with the Wizards, Atlanta, I think you could have used Dwight a little bit more in a pick and roll game, especially with Schroeder, where Tim Hardaway was the only guy that could consistently knock down outside shots, outside of Millsap. I just think you could have got a little bit more out of him. So it's I'm not going to throw away the typical Dwight thing because you didn't show enough for me to give you that much of the benefit of the doubt. But I do think you put in some work this year to get better. But I don't really want to hear you complaining about it. I feel like it's typical Dwight. Uh, yeah. The reason why you weren't playing late in games is because you're still not a good enough free throw shooter for him to have you in there. He can't trust you, and um, you're a liability. And don't think they won't go to you know hacker Dwight to try to win the games, the playoffs. And like I love about the playoffs, all your weaknesses and everything, whatever mm -hmm. you you got holes in as an individual player, as a team, you, it gets exposed. So you know he playing, he played the odds. You know you push the Wizards with that. You know what I'm saying? And I don't think you would have beat the Wizards with you on the floor. And it's just, you know, just being honest with, you know, like he did a good job on going to defensively. Like he, like he said, defensively, he's a beast. You know, mm -hmm. go tag, I mean, he, he couldn't get anything, man. He just couldn't shoot all that monster, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, on the offense, man, what were you doing? And when Bill and Wall going in there dropping 40 and 30 apiece, it's a problem. So now your defense, you know, we need some offense to keep up with that. Right. Then what's coming up, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it, to me, it, it's just a reflection of who he's been throughout his career. And uh, it kind of speaks to what you was talking about earlier. I, I want to say he was overly entitled, but you got to look in the mirror. You know, I can't blame the coach if I know I didn't do something right, if I didn't measure up in these areas. I mean, I'm not I'm not about to do that. I'm like, man, like you say he shot better as a free throw shooter, but what was his percentage? I'm pretty sure it was maybe low, low 60s. That's still not good enough. And if you're shooting in, like, high 70s, low 80s, then that, I, I, now, I definitely that. agree with you at the end of the game. He should be on the court. But that's what he was talking about at the end of the game, not not oh. only through the, oh, at the end of the game. That's what I'm saying. So, oh, specifically his comments, yeah, specifically at the end of the game? Yeah. He needs to shut up. That's what I'm yeah. saying. So <laughs> what are we talking about? I'm but, sorry. Sorry, Dwight. You had like, me for a second. And like you said, every stop is always everybody else. Yeah. It was Kobe in L.A. It was James Harden. In Orlando, you ain't like Stan Van yelling at you. 
No. Bro, you've been in the league since 04, man. Like, you a grown man. Like, man, come on, man. It, it, it gets old. Don't nobody want to hear you crying no more. You know, just and, and especially after the loss. Now you just like a crybaby to me. So, you know how they go. Um, <laughs> are the Raptors already beaten? Oh, yeah. I'm going to say no. <laughs> I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, you know, just because I like to play devil's advocate. You have and a I, lot of faith. And I don't want to see Cleveland go again. But, you know, just for the benefit of the doubt, I won't say it's over right now, you know. We'll see how game two goes. Because, I, I mean, I felt like they, they tried to hang around as much as they possibly could. And we know that sometimes Cleveland has lapses, even though this is the playoffs and this is completely different. Um, but, you know, I give them, I still give them a little bit of a chance, you know. They got a little bit of a chance. No? Okay. Eternal optimist, man. Go to, uh, <laughs> we had a couple comments from Facebook talking about um, it might apply to both uh, <laughs> um, Blake and White. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the guys, uh, Darrell Wilson, he was just like he's soft. Um, could apply to either or. <laughs> I'm just seeing pick. it now, so. Take your going out there. Um, and then they also wanted to talk about Arkansas Razorbacks football. So I'm sorry it's not happening today at the <laughs> moment. We did mention uh, Jeremy Sprinkle earlier. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Just wanted to share some of the comments. No, the Raptors. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Calvary is so tough. <laughs> yeah, he's so tough. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't think they're going to get swept. And I don't think it's like. It's, it might not be. It's not gonna be like a four-one. I mean, three. You know, I mean, I, I think, I think they'll take it to six. Uh, I don't think they can win a series, but uh, you know, that Bron, that Kyrie, that's that's <laughs> tough. Yeah, that's the problem. Uh, I don't know. I think it the max is five, like, and, I, and I'm saying that because I think LeBron and MC was out west, and I think they want to handle business as much. They don't want to mess around as mm -hmm. much as possible, so they're gonna be ready. Because, you know, they don't want to keep playing seven-game, six, seven-game series, and then the Warriors waiting for them. Oh, and it's well like, oh, rested. man, we got to chase these dudes. <laughs> yeah, and you tired. Like, that's not going to work this year. So they want to just get these guys up out of the way. I think that's what they're, you know, they're focused. But like you said, they tend to have lapses, and they can steal a game. But I think once they lose. It'll, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm I feel like they'll, they'll get at least one. Um, but I feel like, you know, that one lapse that they may have, the Cavs may have, it'll snap them right back into it and be like, all right, we got to stop playing. <laughs> I don't think they get one. That could happen too. Oh, four? The yeah. broom's coming out? Yeah, I mean, just I don't have a high opinion of the Raptors anyway. So. <laughs> the only thing is, like, the Raptors do this every year, so. <laughs> no, no, but the matchups with Cleveland, obviously you can't stop LeBron, but yeah. Lowry can't do nothing with Kyrie. No. Like, he tears yeah. him up every, like, mm -hmm. every way time. Past <laughs> and people forget last year what kind of saved the Raptors. They don't have any more Bismarck Beyond, but that, mm -hmm. that, that energy, high motor, That's dirty true. work. That's true. He, 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 uh, he was taking it to Tristan a couple of those games, and that helped him win the game. That's not there. Ibaka ain't that dude no more. Dude, you want to know when you just said Bismarck, the first thing that came to mind, when Shump strolled down the lane and bodied him? Yeah, Bismarck would have been up there. Yeah, Bismarck, the I wish you, he wouldn't even try that last year. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, that tells you. I mean, I, I – you a coach. I, I got to ask you first. Explain the <laughs> Spurs-Houston game last night. <laughs> like, just tell me what happened. You know what's crazy, man? The Spurs look like – the Spurs look so old last night. <laughs> and then what Houston was doing, that I thought was pretty smart. Houston was making it like a three-on-three -three or four-on-four game. They would set like a high screen, like right around like the half-court area, like a flat ball screen, and Harden would just get off of it. And the next thing you know, it's three-on-three, -three, so Spurs can't pack it in on them. Mm -hmm. So they spread the court even more with your shooters and everything like that. So I think them spreading it, spreading it out. I mean, they made a lot of shots too. Yeah. I mean, I, I just I'm not sure if this, if Houston gonna be able to shoot like that every game. But I mean, they hit a lot of shots and, and their game plan was good. They was gonna get downhill early and they was gonna make them guard them in like a like a three on three game, which they picked them apart. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was just at a loss for words. I was just yeah, like. Was crazy. What? But that was a good point. They did look really old compared to them last night because it was like it was just going up and down, up and down. And, you know, they can't keep up with them in, in, in the fast breaks. So they had to do something, and they couldn't slow the game down. You know, they I think the one thing that they were talking about was the pace. You know, they wanted to keep the pace up, of course. But I'm just interested to see how Popovich um, adjusts for the next game. So I think that's the most thing I'm I'm looking forward to because it's still pop at the end of the day. So you know he he's doing work and figuring out how they're going to get this fixed. Um, so I'm expecting for the next game to 
well, it can only be better than the last game, but right. <laughs> hopefully. Um, and like you said, like, you know, Houston do have a lot of shooters, does have a lot of shooters, um, but I don't know if they're going to shoot like that every night, you know, every game, because yeah. they were, like, how many threes do they have? Like, I feel like it was like 20. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> um, like I said, you, Cardell, when we talked <laughs> before the show started, uh, I think Pop's going to lean on some of the youngsters. It might be time. If you want to get out this series, um, uh, I always mess up his first name, but Mur Murray. Johnson, Murray. Yeah, Marshall. I always mess up his first name. You might want to get that length out there because with the pace that is going at, Tony Tony can't do this, okay? And like you were talking about, when they, where they were setting that screen, they're coming downhill on – like it was Tony, the culprit, a couple times. Yeah. And I feel like Mike Dan Tony's – I used to, like, picking on him. Because why would you go at Kawhi? You want to take Kawhi out the equation. Yeah, so if you're going three on three and Kawhi's on the on the far side of the court, he can't help because he's on the shooter. And mm -mm. then that's what they did also. Pop like, all right, go get Harden. You yep. know what else? Lou Williams get on. He yep. got to go get him. That wears him down. So then he's ineffective. And by that time, the game was over. So they had problems. Like I said, you know, I talked to a lot of guys. And they was like, man, the Spurs are I'm like, nah. Like, they shoot the ball well. They, they could beat the Spurs because they have so many weapons. And picking mm -hmm. up Lou Williams just – Oh, man. That really that, – and it was a steal. I'm like, I don't even know what they gave up for him. Nothing. <laughs> yes. Nothing. Exactly. And I'm, I'm like and, – and they forget, I think, in the regular season, Houston was that the first team that went on Golden State and yeah. beat the hell out of them yep. in, in their gym. You know, they like – You know what I'm saying? So, I'm like, they, they can hang if they strap up and do that, man. It, it's – it's gonna be interesting, man. Cause mm -hmm. last night they put people on that. And now I'm for. I'm like, okay, I believe now. Cause, <laughs> but like you said, you gotta have youth movement. And you gotta have guys that can keep up and you know speed up with them. OKC had guys that could do that defensively. They couldn't do nothing mm -hmm. offensively. You know, the Spurs look like they got guys. They got guys that could do it offensively, but they don't have the energy on defense. And I think a lot. And then I think another underrated aspect. I think Memphis took a lot out of them. I think yes. they, uh, mm -hmm. Mike Conley, Gasol, the Big Zach, and Benson, all them guys. They. They made them work harder than what they anticipated. So that's that goes back to the LeBron. Like we not trying to be in those long because that drains you. Mm -hmm. So when you finally match up against a threat, you don't have the energy to summon up it. Then that's how they get you up out of there. You know. Mm -hmm. So you know it's gonna be interesting. And um, last question: uh, Larry Bird steps down as president of basketball operation. Was it time or was the writing on the wall because you know he feels that Paul George is, you know, he's gone. You know, pretty much. I'll start. Um, I don't really know. Like, to me, it was a surprise. Um, I thought, like, you know, Larry was there and, and involved and, 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 like, plans on bringing people. Like, they had him out there, like, trying to get them to have the All-Star game in Indianapolis one year or something like that. So, um, to me, it was a surprise. Um, but I get what you're saying. You know, it, Paul George is basically gone, you know. Um, and I don't know if he doesn't believe, like, he can – pulled it back together or, or what the whole reasoning was behind him stepping down. So I'm a little bit, you know, I'm not sure why he did it, but it's been done. I'm not sure if Larry Brown wanted to be a part of a rebuilding situation again. You know what I mean? He's got, like, he's older. Um, I'm just not sure if he had that in him if he wants to do it. So, and like I said, like she said, Paul George is probably more than likely going to be out of there. So, he was just like, you know what, let me bow out gracefully now. Whatever happens, happens. But I'm not trying to mm -hmm. do this again. I mean, it's – and they had a tough market too. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, I'm not saying who wants to go play at Indiana, but, like, who wants to go play at Indiana? <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? so, time. They call it nap time for a reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, oh, gosh. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know. didn't even realize that. They do. They call it nap time. But, um, but the thing is <clears> – <throat> That's why you can't go by what's on paper. At the beginning of the season when they had Thaddeus Young and C <laughs> and they had all those pieces, you was like, man, did they come to play like – they could run with the Cavs, and then they got off to the slow, slow, you know, and then they just carried on. They barely made a playoff, mm -hmm. so can't always believe what you see on paper. What's, what's your take? Yeah, Paul George gone. Oh, that's that's why he stepped like, down. I mean, he rolled out an Indy car like it's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, what I'm saying. It's like, like he I'm was driving here. the Indy car like, around. He even got an Indy car. Like just, I want. He left in a way to say I want nothing to do with basketball. Oh, it's like, like I'm cool. retired. I said like, I'm, I'm done. It's been real, but. And like as you said, I, he's not staying for rebuilding. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and if, if you're bouncing right now, I think it would be different if you had assets to go on a draft like you had with Bat Boston had. It's a little bit different because it wouldn't be a rebuild as much as a reload. Mm -hmm. But right now, like, your hopes on getting free agents was based around the dude who I – like, that just told me Paul George was gone. Yeah. Yeah, that sealed it right there. Mm -hmm. so, that's it for Raptor Fire. All right, we want to thank Raptor everyone. It, it's always fun, man. And happy to have the Raptor Fire – you know, moderator back. It's not the same without Cardell. So thank you for coming back. 
Um, Coach McCray, thank you so much. Man, thanks for having me. I appreciate you guys. Oh, no, nah, man. It, the pleasure was all ours. Um, I'd say if you're happy to have you back. Uh, thank Carl from Retrofit for coming through as well. And his adorable son. He's so <laughs> cute. They had a good time. We enjoyed you guys tuning in this evening. As always, head over to finestmag.com. Then hit my mind on sports. And then uh, definitely, definitely like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram as well. Um, it was kind of a slight week last week, which was great because, you know, Cardell and I do have lives and families and sometimes like to see them. Um, so I'm sure we'll have more stuff coming in the coming weeks because summer is always a grind. Got the Pits League coming. 22nd. Um, we got trials for the Pits League this weekend. Free agent trials will be Sunday, 4.30, Largo. Yep, so in interested in seeing uh, for those who want to get who want to get in one of the best summer leagues in the area. Um that's one way to do it. In case you don't know anybody, it's always a good bump. So thank you as always for listening, watching, and, and <laughs> just viewing in general. We'll see you guys next week. This is the focus.